Just at dusk, a soft September rain began to fall on the hop pickers. The mothers wheeled the bouncing perambulators out of the gardens. Bins were put away, and tally books made up. The young couple strolled home, two to each umbrella, and the single men walked behind them, laughing. Dan and Una, who had been picking after their lessons, marched off to roast potatoes at the oast house, where old Hobden, with blue-eyed Bess, his lurcher dog, lived all the month through, drying the hops. They settled themselves, as usual, on the sack-strewn cot in front of the fires, and, when Hobden drew up the shutter, stared, as usual, at the flameless bed of coals spouting its heat up the dark well of the old-fashioned round elm. Slowly he cracked off a few fresh pieces of coal, packed them, with fingers that never flinched, exactly where they would do most good. Slowly he reached behind him, till Dan tilted the potatoes into his iron scoop of a hand. Carefully he arranged them round the fire, and then stood for a moment, black against the glare. As he closed the shutter, the oast house seemed dark before the day's end, and he lit the candle in the lanthorn. The children liked all these things, because they knew them so well. The bee-boy, Hobden's son, who is not quite right in his head, though he can do anything with bees, slipped in like a shadow. They only guessed it when Bess's stump-tail wagged against them. A big voice began singing outside in the drizzle. Old Mother Lady Wool had nigh twelve months been dead. She heard the hops were doing well, and then popped up her head. There can't be two people made to holler like that, cried old Hobden, wheeling round. For, says she, the boys are pit with when I was young and bad. They're bound to be hopping and I'm... A man showed at the doorway. Well, well, they do say hopping or jaw the very deadest, and now I believed them. You, Tom, Tom Shoesmith. Hobden lowered his lanthorn. You're a hem of a time making your mind to it, Ralph. The stranger strode in, three full inches taller than Hobden, a grey-whiskered, brown-faced giant with clear blue eyes. They shook hands, and the children could hear the hard palms rasp together. You ain't lost none of your grip, said Hobden. Was it thirty or forty year back? You broke my head at Peasmarsh Fair. Only thirty, and no odds tween us regarding heads neither. You had it back at me with a hot pole. How did we get home that night, swimming? Same way the pheasant come into Gubb's pocket, by a little luck and a deal of conjuring. <laughs> Old Hobden laughed in his deep chest. I see you've not forgot your way about the woods. Do you do any of this still? The stranger pretended to look along a gum. Hobden answered uh, with a quick movement of the hand, as though he were pegging down a rabbit wire. No, that's all that's left me now. Aid she must as aid she can. And what's your news since all these years? Oh, I've been to Plymouth, I've been to Dover, I've been rambling boys the wide world over, the man answered cheerily. I reckon I know as much of old England as most. He turned towards the children, and winked boldly. I lay they told you a sight of lies, then. I've been into England fur as Wiltshire once. I was cheated proper over a pair of hedging gloves, said Hobden. There's fancy talking everywhere. You've cleaved to your own parts pretty middling close, Ralph. Can't shift an old tree without it dying, Hobden chuckled and I be no more anxious to die than you look to be to help me with my hops to-night. The great man leaned against the brickwork of the randal and swung his arms abroad. Hire me, was all he said, and they stumped upstairs, laughing. The children heard their shovels rasp on the cloth where the yellow hops lie drying above the fires, and all the oast-house 
filled with the sweet sleepy smell as they were turned who is it una whispered to the b-boy dunno no more than you if you dunno said he and smiled the voices on the drying floor talked and chuckled together and the heavy footsteps moved back and forth presently a hot pocket dropped through the press hole overhead and stiffened and fattened as they shoveled it full clank went the press and rammed the loose stuff into tight cake gently they heard hobden cry you'll bust a crop if you lay on so you'd be as careless as gleason's bull tom come and sit by the fires she'll do now they came down and as hobden opened the shutter to see if the potatoes were done tom shoesmith said to the children put a plenty salt on em that'll show you the sort of man i be again he winked and again the b-boy laughed and una stared at dan i know what sort of man you be old hobden grunted groping for the potatoes round the fire do ye tom went on behind his back some of us can't abide horseshoes or church bells or running water and talking of running water he turned to hobden who was backing out of the roundel do you mind the great floods at robertsbridge when the miller's man was drowned in the street middlin well old hobden let himself down on the coals by the fire door i was caught in my woman on the marsh that year carter to must plumb i was getting ten shillings week mine was a marsh woman wonderful odd gates place romney marsh said tom shoesmith i've heard say the world's divided like into europe ashy Africy, Ameriky, Australy, and Romney Marsh. The Marsh folk think so, said Hobden. I had a hammer trouble to get my woman to leave it. Where did she come out of? I forgot, Ralph. Dim church under the wall, Hobden answered, a potato in his hand. Then she'd be a pet, or a wit gift, would she? Wit gift? Hobden broke open the potato, and ate it with the curious neatness of men who make most of their meals in the blowy open. She growed to be quite reasonable like, after living in the weald a while, but our first twenty year or two she was odd fashioned no bounds. And she was a wonderful hand with bees. He cut away a little piece of potato, and threw it out to the door. Ah. Uh, I've heard say the Whitgifts could see further through a millstone than most, said Shoesmith. Did she, Nan? She was honest innocent of any nigromancer, said Hobden. Only she'd read signs and significations at a bird's flying, stars fallen, bees hiving, and such. And she'd lie awake, listening for calls, she said. That don't prove naught, said Tom. All marsh folk has been smugglers since time everlasting. Could be in her blood to listen out o' nights. Naturally, old Hobden replied, smiling. I mind when they were smuggling a sight nearer us than what the marsh be. But that wasn't my woman's trouble. Twas a passel and nonsense talk. He dropped his voice. About Pharisees. Yes, I've heard Marsh men believed in em. Tom looked straight at the wide-eyed children beside Bess. Pharisees, cried Una, fairies, oh, I see. People of the hills, said the bee-boy, throwing half of his potato towards the door. There you be, said Hobden, pointing at him. My boy, he has her eyes and her outgate sense. That's what she called em. And what did you think of it all? Mm. Mm. Hobden rumbled. A man that uses fields and shores after dark as much as I've done, he don't go out of his road except for keepers. But setting that aside, said Tom coaxingly, I saw ye throw the good piece out at doors just now. Do ye believe or do ye? 
There was a great black eye to that tater, said Hobden indignantly. My little eye didn't see him then. It looked as if you meant it for, for any one that might need it. But setting that aside, do you believe, or do ye? I ain't saying nothing, because I've heard naught, and I've seen naught. But if you was to say, there was more things after dark in the shores than men, or fur, or feather, or fin, I dunno as I go far about to call you a liar. Now, turn again, Tom, what's your say? I'm like you, I say nothing, but I'll tell you a tale, and you can fit it, as are you please. Passel and nonsense stuff, growled Hobden, but he filled his pipe. The marsh men, they call it Dimchurch Flit, Tom went on slowly. Hap you have heard it? My woman, she told it me scores of times. Dunno as I didn't end by belief in it sometimes. Hobden crossed over as he spoke, and sucked with his pipe up the yellow lanthorn flame. Tom rested one great elbow on one great knee, where he sat among the coal. "'Have you ever been in the marsh?' he said to Dan. "'Only as far as Rye, once,' Dan answered. "'Ah, oh, that's but the edge. Back behind of her, there's steeples settin' beside churches, and wise women settin' beside their doors, and the sea settin' above the land, and ducks herdin' wild in the dicks. He meant ditches. The marsh is just about riddled with dicks and sluices and tide gates and water lets. You can hear em bubblin and grumblin when the tide works in em, and then you hear the sea rangin left and right, handed all up along the wall. You've seen how flat she is, the marsh. You'd think nothing easier than to walk end on across her. Ah. But the dicks and the waterlets, they twist the roads about as rabbly as witch yarn on the spindles. So you get all turned round in broad daylight. That's because they drain the waters into the dicks, said Hobden. When I courted my woman, the rushes was green. Ah, me, the rushes was green. And the bailiff of the marshes, he rode up and down as free as the fog. Who was he? said Dan. Why, the marsh fever and ague. He clapped me on the shoulder once or twice till I shook proper. But now the draining off of the waters have done away with the fevers, so they make a joke like that the bailiff of the marshes broke his neck in the dike. A wonderful place for bees and ducks tis too. And old oh, Tom went on, flesh and blood have been there since time everlasting beyond. Well now, speaking among themselves, the marsh men say that from time everlasting beyond the Pharisees favoured the marsh above the rest of old England. I lay the marsh men ought to know. They've been out after dark, father and son, smuggling some one thing or t'other, since ever wool grew to sheep's backs. They say there was always a middle in few Pharisees to be seen on the marsh. Impudent as rabbits they was. They dance on the naked road in the naked daytime. They flash their little green lights along the dikes, coming and going, like honest smugglers. Yes, and times they'd lock the church doors against parson and clerk of Sundays. That had beat smugglers laying in the lace or the brandy till they could run it out of the marsh. I've told my woman so, said Hobden. I'll lay she didn't believe it then, not if she was a wit gift. A wonderful choice place for Pharisees, the marsh, by all accounts, till Queen Bessie's father, he come in with his reformatories. Would that be a act of parliament like? Hobden asked. Surely can't do nothing in old England without act, warrant, and summons. He got his act allowed him, and, they say, Queen Bessie's father, he used the parish church as something shameful, just about tore the gizzards out of I dunna many. Some folk in England they held with them, but some they saw it different, 
and it ended in em taking sides and burning each other no bounds according which side was top time beam that terrified the pharisees for good will among flesh and blood is meat and drink to em and ill will is poison same as bees said the bee boy bees won't stay by a house where there's hating true said tom this reformatories terrified the pharisees same as the reaper going round a last stand a week terrifies rabbits they packed into the marsh from all parts and they says fair or foul we must flit out of this for merry england's done with and were reckoned among the images did they all see it that way said hobden all but one that was called robin if you've heard of him what are you laughing at tom turned to dan the pharisees trouble didn't touch robin because he'd cleave middling clothes to people like no more he never meant to go out of old england not he so he was sent messaging for help among flesh and blood but flesh and blood must always think of their own concerns and robin couldn't get through at em you see they thought it was tide echoes up the marsh what did you oh what did the ph pharisees want una asked a boat to be sure of their little wings could no more cross channel than so many tired butterflies a boat and a crew they desired to sail them over to france where yet a while folks hadn't tore down the images they couldn't abide cruel canterbury bells ringing to bulverhithe for more poor men and women to be burned nor the king's proud messenger riding through the land giving orders to tear down the images they couldn't abide it in no shape nor yet they couldn't get their boat and crew to flit by without leave and good will from flesh and blood and flesh and blood came and went about its own business the while the marsh was swabbing up and swabbing up with pharisees from all england over striving all means to get through at flesh and blood to tell em their sore need i don't know as you've ever heard say pharisees are like chickens my woman used to say that too said hobden folding his brown arms they be you run too many chickens together and the ground sickens like and you get a squat and your chickens die same way you crowd pharisees all in one place they don't die but flesh and blood walking among em is apt to sick up and pine off they don't mean it and flesh and blood don't know it but that's the truth as i've heard the pharisees through being all stenched up and frighted and trying to come through with their supplications they naturally change the thin airs and humours in flesh and blood it lay on the marsh like thunder men saw their churches ablaze with the wild fire in the windows after dark they saw their cattle scattering and no man scare him their sheep flocking and no man drive him their horses lather him and no man lead him they saw the little low green lights more than ever in the dyke sides they heard the little feet pattering more than ever round the houses and night and day day and night twas all as though they were being creeped upon and hinted at by some one or other that couldn't rightly shape their trouble oh i lay they sweated man and maid woman and child their nature done em no service all the weeks while the marsh was swabbing up with pharisees but they was flesh and blood and marsh men before all they reckoned the signs signified trouble for the marsh or that the sea had rear up against dim church wall and they'd be drowned like old winchelsea or that the plague was coming so they looked for the meaning in the sea or in the clouds far and high up they never thought to look near and knee high where they could see naught now there was a poor widow at dimchurch under the wall which lacking man or property she had the more time for feeling and she come to feel there was a trouble outside her doorstep bigger and heavier than all she ever carried over it she had two sons one born blind and t'other struck dumb through falling off the wall when he was little they was men grown but not wage earning and she worked for em 
keeping bees, and answering questions. "'What sort of questions?' said Dan. "'Like where lost things might be found, and what to put about a crooked baby's neck, and how to join parted sweethearts.' She felt the trouble on the marsh, same as eels feel thunder. She was a wise woman. "'My woman was wonderful weather tender too,' said Obdam. "'I've seen her brush sparks like off an anvil out of her hair in thunderstorms. "'But she never laid out to answer questions. "'This woman was a seeker-like, and seekers they sometimes find. "'One night, while she lay abed hot and aching, "'there come a dream, and tapped at a window. "'And with a wicket, it said, with a wicket. First, by the wings and the whistling, she thought it was peewits, but last she arose and dressed herself, and opened her door to the marsh, and she felt the trouble and the groaning all about her, strong as fever and ague, and she calls, What is it? Oh, what is it? Then twas all like the frogs in the dikes peeping, then twas all like the reeds in the dikes clip clapping, and then the great tide wave rummled along the wall, and she couldn't hear proper. Three times she called, and three times the tide wave did her down. But she catched the quiet between, and she cries out, What is the trouble on the marsh that's been lying down with my heart and arising with my body this month gone? She felt a little hand lay hold on her gown hem, and she stooped to the pull of that little hand. Tom Shoesmith spread his huge fist before the fire and smiled at it. "'Will the sea drown the marsh?' she says. She was a marsh woman first and foremost. "'No,' says the little voice. "'Sleep sound for all of that. "'Is the plague coming to the marsh?' she says. "'Them was all the ill she knowed. "'No, sleep sound for all of that,' says Robin. She turned about, half mindful to go in. But the little voice breathed that shrill and sorrowful she turns back and she cries, If it is not a trouble of flesh and blood, what can I do? The Pharisees cried out upon her from all round to fetch them a boat to sail to France and come back no more. There's a boat on the wall, she says, but I can't push it down to the sea, nor sail it when tis there. Lend us your sons, says all the Pharisees. Give them leave and good will to sail it for us, mother on mother. One's dumb and t'other's blind, she says but all the dearer me for that, and you'll lose them in the big sea. The voices just about pierced her through, and there was children's voices too. She stood out all she could, but she couldn't rightly stand against that. So she says, if you can draw my sons for your job, I'll not hinder them. You can't ask no more of a mother. She saw them little green lights dance and cross till she was dizzy. She heard them little feet pattering by the thousand. She heard cruel Canterbury bells ringing to Bulberhithe, and she heard the great tide wave ranging along the wall. That was while the Pharisees was working a dream to wake her two sons asleep, and while she bit on her fingers, she saw them two she bore come out and pass her with never a word. She followed them crying pitiful to the old boat on the wall, and that they took and run down to the sea. When they step mast and sail, the blind son speaks. Mother, we're waiting your leave and good will to take them over. Tom Shoesmith threw back his head and half shut his eyes. Ay me, he said. She was a fine, valiant woman, the widow Whitgift. She stood twisting the ends of her long hair over her fingers, and she shook like a poplar making up her mind. The Pharisees all about, they hushed their children from crying, and they waited dumb still. She was all their dependence. Without her leave and good will, they could not pass, for she was the mother. So she shook like a apse tree, making up her mind. Last, she drives the word past her teeth, and go, she says, go, with my leave and good will. Then I saw, then, they say, she had to brace back, same as if she was wading in tide water, for the Pharisees just about blowed past her, down the beach to the boat. I'd done them many of them, with their wives and children and valuables 
all escaping out of cruel old England. Silver you could hear chinking, and little bundles hove down, dunked on the bottom boards, and passels of little swords and shields, red clean and little fingers and toes scratching on the boat side to board her when the two sons pushed her off. That boat she sunk lower and lower, but all the widow could see in it was her boys moving, hampered like, to get at the tackle. Up sail they did, and away they went, deep as a rye barge, away into the offshore mists, and the widow Whitgift she sat down and eased her grief till morning light. I never heard she was all alone, said Hobden. I remember now. The one called Robin, he stayed with her, they tell. She was all too grievous to listen to his promises. Ah, she should have made her bargain beforehand. I always told my woman so, Hobden cried. No, she loaned her sons for a pure love loan, being as she sensed the trouble on the marshes, and was simple good willing to ease it. Tom laughed softly. She done that. Yes, she done that. From high to boulder high, fretty man and maid, ailing woman and wailing child, they took the advantage of the change in the thin airs just about as soon as the Pharisees flitted. Folks come out fresh and shining all over the marsh, like snails after wet. And that while the widow Whitgift sat grieving on the wall. She might have believed us. She might have trusted her sons would be sent back. She fussed no bounds when their boat come in after three days. And, of course, the sons were both quite cured, said Una. No, that would have been out of nature. She got em back as she sent em. The blind man, he hadn't seen naught of anything. And the dumb man, naturally, he couldn't say aught of what he'd seen. I reckon that was why the Pharisees pitched on em for the ferrying job. But what did you, uh, what did Robin promise the widow? said Dan. What did he promise now? Tom pretended to think. Wasn't a your woman a wit gift, Ralph? Didn't she ever say? She told me a passel of no sense stuff when he was born. Hobden pointed at his son. There was always to be one of them that could see further into a millstone than most. Me, that's me, said the bee boy so suddenly that they all laughed. I got it now, cried Tom, slapping his knee. So long as Whitgift blood lasted, Robin promised there would always be one o' her stock, but that no trouble would lie on, no maid would sigh on, no night could frighten, no fright could harm, no harm could make sin, and no woman could make a fool of. Well, ain't that just me? said the bee-boy where he sat in the silver square of the great September moon that was staring into the oast house door. They was the exact word she told me when we first found he wasn't like others. But it beats me how you known him, said Hobden. Ah, there's more under my hat besides hair. <laughs> Tom laughed and stretched himself. When I've seen these two young folk home, We'll make a night of old days, Ralph, with passing old tales, eh? And where might you live? he said gravely to Dan. And do you think your pa would give me a drink for taking you there, missy? They giggled so at this that they had to run out. Tom picked them both up, set one on each broad shoulder, and tramped across the ferny pasture where the cows puffed milky pups at them in the moonlight. Oh, pup, pup, I guessed you right from when you talked about the salt. How could you ever do it? Una cried, swinging along, delighted. Do what, he said, and climbed the stile by the pollard oak. Pretend to be Tom Shoesmith, said Dan, and they ducked to avoid the two little ashes that grow by the bridge over the brook. Tom was almost running. Yes, that's my name, Mus Dan, he said, hurrying over the silent shining lawn where a rabbit sat by the big white thorn near the croquet ground. Here you be. He strode into the old kitchen yard and slid them down as Ellen came to ask questions. I'm helping in Miss Spray's oast house, he said to her. No, I'm no foreigner. I know this country, for your mother was born. And yes, it's dry work, oasting, miss. Thank you. Ellen went to get a jug, and the children went in, magicked once more by Oak Ash.